definitely a war going on till the breakthrough. You can feel the the uh, battle has shifted. I never felt more activity than I felt the last few days. Something is close, and I'm thankful that we are going to be the victors, and we're going to have a breakthrough in that building in Jesus' name. started our chosen calls on Tuesday nights a few months ago, and we had about six or eight families that joined, and I was telling a pastor this morning, last night we had 39 families that joined our chosen call, and (laughs) amen, and our membership, since we started Multiply, which was October. October 1st, went from 83 to 160 in five months. God is really doing this. Sundays, it's packed, and we're thankful. Come early Easter Sunday, get your seat. You come late, you get mad. Sorry, because I believe it's going to be full in here Sunday morning, and we're headed somewhere in Jesus' name. Thank you to all of our singers and musicians, sound team. I know there was a lot of difficulties tonight. There's another church that uses this building on the fourth Sunday of each month on Sunday night, and they mess with everything. Praise God. Bless him, Lord. Hmm. I pray they get this building and we get somewhere else so we can, we can not deal with that anymore. Luke chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 11, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. 16 and 17, then Hebrews 11, 21. This is more of a Sunday message than, but the Lord, I just do what he tells me. So Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Verse 16, and he's explaining what he did. He said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from the bond, this bond on the Sabbath day, and When he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. I am going to attempt to preach to you from the subject bent on worshiping, bent on worshiping. This is my seventh, eighth night. I I spoke twice last night, so tenth time in the last ten days. We're going to have a breakthrough tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I release the gift of faith right now in this room. Somebody's going to get a miracle tonight in this building. I thank you for what you're going to do at Revival Tabernacle on Wednesday night for someone who drove through the traffic to get here to hear the word of the Lord. Do something only you can do. We put the rest of this service in your hands right now. And somebody said, in Jesus' name, and you may be seated. It's like I'm facing the Red Sea. It's parted on this side and that side. Y'all afraid of the middle? These three guys are heroes right here. There we go. Okay. Seems like we suffer our way into the kingdom of God. Worshippers come in all shapes and sizes. Or should I say they arrive in all kinds of trials and traumas. Seems like the people who go through the most hide it the best. People that don't go through a lot want everyone to know what they're going through. But the ones that really have gone through something and they are a worshiper, you can't really tell what they've been through because they just have this demeanor about them that 
He's been good to me. I love being around people that I don't know what they went through, but I can feel that they've been through something because their worship has more weight to it. There's just a, who is that person that feel, oh, an angel just came by me. And we just, it seems the more we do our chosen calls, like for last night, Brother Snavely told his story, and I've never seen more comments on a story. And, and it seems like the more we do these calls, the more I'm finding out as a pastor that everyone that's coming here is coming here from through some kind of pain or tragedy or attack or all three, and, and they get here, and then this church is just taking them up and engulfing them, and the power of God is just loving them, and everybody has a story and a testimony, and I'm, I just, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm thankful for you. I love you. And I'm very proud of you because you have gone through so many things, but yet you are fighting with me, and I, I can't thank you enough for that. We all came through different pathways of pain, Brother Cade, to get here, and for some it was an event, a one-time bomb explosion, a terrible tragedy, a, a loss of a loved one, something horrible. And for others, it was event after event after event, trial after trial. And the journey to Jesus was full of pain and heartache. And it's a language we can all understand in this room, and that is the language of pain. If you've lived for God more than five minutes, you've been through something, and you know it's real. And underneath your coat, there are scars, and there are wounds, and there's, but I'm still here. Aren't you glad you're still here? <laughs> the journey is rough, but Jesus is worth the journey. All right, let's go. Her journey to Jesus started 18 years before she met him. Most of them would never have survived this long because 18 years before she met Jesus, she met Satan. I've told several people Satan only attacked around 10 people in the entire body and the entire Bible personally. We, we think that Satan is after everybody in the room and Satan is attacking me. The devil's on my trail. And, and the truth is in the Bible, he only, messed, he only personally messed with a few people. He messed with Moses. When Moses died, he wanted his body. We know he messed with Job. We know that he messed with Jesus. We know that he wanted Peter. We know he got after Judas. We know he went after Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said, Satan filled your heart. And then this unknown lady, 18 years before she met Jesus, she met Satan. Mm. And the Bible said a spirit of infirmity was on her, and, and it attached itself. I don't know how it attached itself. Maybe she was hurting. Maybe she was wounded. Maybe she was bitter because spirits attach themselves to you when you are wounded or when you are bitter, when you are vulnerable, when you are weak. That's when spirits try to move in the house with you, and all of a sudden you feel things moving in the room or moving in your head, and, and you don't even know what it means. And the spirit got on her and made itself a home 18 years. I don't know why God let this spirit come to her. For, let, me under, let me say something to you. For a demon to attack you, I know you know this, but just, just for the record, for a demon to attack you, it has to get permission from God to attack you. You understand that? He doesn't, it doesn't just run rogue and hit you. It has to be allowed to hit you. Even Satan himself has to give a report to God on where he's going. And so you understand that when this spirit came to her, God allowed it. I don't know why God allows some things to happen. I don't know why God allowed Job to go through all those stuff that the devil did on him. But God allowed it. And the spirit was allowed to get a hold of her. Infirmity, the, the word infirmity means to cause one to be weak and to lose one's strength. And so this spirit attached itself to her. And, 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 and now for 18 years, a demon is on her. Day by day, her strength was fading. And 
the shoulders begin to slump and the back begins to arch and and day after day the pressure of the demon that she doesn't know is a demon she just thinks there's something wrong in her body but it's nothing physical it's a spirit that's attached itself and now she's feeling pressure from behind her and the, the pressure is starting to to bow her in half to push her her head down towards her toes and and pressure no one can see and pressure no one can feel and pressure is crushing her and yet when you look at her you can think what's really wrong with you why there's there's really nothing wrong with you but today her shoulders were here but tomorrow her shoulders are there and a year from now her shoulders will be down here and six years from now she was down here and by the time 18 years had gone by she was completely bent in half pressure had bowed her in half. Now she is half the person she used to be. Now her vision is not what it used to be. She looked, used to look at the clouds, but now she's forced to stare at the ground because pressure has come in such a way and not lifted off of her month after month, year after year, to now she's staring at her shoes everywhere she goes. She makes a scene. She's the awkward one in the room. She stands out because she doesn't stand up. She's been humiliated by hell. She's judged by her handicap. And every room she goes in, she's a distraction because hell has put a spirit right on her neck and no one has... Oh, it's just a mental disorder. No, it's a spirit. Oh, I'm sorry for some of you that didn't want to get with that right there. But... A Oh, I just stirred up a hornet's nest right there. Some of you don't even believe in spirits, and you give a name for every mental problem you have, and there's a demon attacking your mind that needs to be cast out of you, and you will feel different, and you will have peace. You're not a schizophrenic. You're a child of God. You don't have to live in a phobia. You don't have to live with a split personality. You can be delivered. I know it sounds crazy, but he's still bigger than anxiety, and he's bigger than depression, and he's bigger than suicide, and he's bigger than everything attacking your mind. He is bigger. No one's there to tell her this. She's just bent in half. If you could have seen me in my prime. I want to preach to the I wasn't always like this, people. Hmm. The one thing about humans that unfortunately is so messed up is that we judge people on the condition they are in when we meet them. We see someone broken, and we assume they've always been broken. We see someone homeless, we assume they've always been homeless. We see someone going through something, we assume they've always gone through it. Because our minds naturally judge someone and put them in the box that they're currently in when they meet us. But she wasn't always this way. She wasn't always like this. Should have seen me before I had kids. Last time I golfed, I think, was the day before Jew was born. <laughs> you have kids, your life ends. Amen. But your life begins a totally different way. Should have seen me before I went to prison. Should have seen me before I lost everything. You should have, should have seen me when I had all my money. You should have seen me when I... When I had all my connections, you should have seen me when I was thriving. You should have seen me when I was popular and everybody. You should have, and we want people to see the best us, not the bent us. Because there's nothing impressive about her arrival now. And no one understands that one, there was a day when her shoulders were back and she walked with her head up and she could talk to you just fine and she could look you in the eye and tell you that everything was okay. But something has happened and no one knows what it is. And now I'm just... I'm under pressure. If you should have 
seen me when I was doing good. Oh, man. Have you ever wanted to tell people I wasn't always like this? Seven people? Yeah. You're amazing. But what I like about her is even though she's bent in half, she still was at church that day. Sorry, Internet people. You warriors. My head is hurting. I think I'll just stay here. Why don't you come to church and be healed? No, no, no. This lady is bent in half and says, I'm going to get there somehow. What would happen if anybody had that mentality in America? No matter what's in, I'll stare at my shoes all the way to the altar, but when I get there, something's going to happen. I don't care what the journey is. I've got to get to I don't care how long I've got to wait in traffic. I've got to get to Jesus. I don't care how many things I've got to deal with tomorrow. I've got to get to Jesus. I don't care how many bills are on the table. I've got to get to Jesus. I mean, surely somebody had to help her because she can't even lift her head up. This way, go left here. Maybe she had to lay down, or maybe she had to turn sometimes. And okay, there, there it is. And, and, and you talk about determination, with no guarantee of a miracle, with no guarantee of an answer, with no guarantee of a change. I like it when people come to church and there's no guarantee anything's going to get better. But you couldn't stop them with an army because they've made up their mind. I am going to get there, no matter what's in my. And when Jesus saw her, she didn't even see him. She couldn't. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him. I'm like, isn't that kind of mean? Like, you can't just like walk 20 feet? God, I'm just just kidding. Bring her over here. I mean... Sometimes when you think you've gone as far as you can go, Jesus thinks you can go further. Jesus is like, I think you got three more steps in you. I think you got three more weeks of praying. I, I know you want the miracle today, but I think you got three more months of going out. I know you want the answer t- yesterday, but I think you can hold on. If I don't answer you tomorrow, I think you'll still be here Sunday. I, I think you can take another step. Sometimes God believes in your strength more than you do. Sometimes God believes that even though you think it's over, he knows my strength is made perfect in your weakness, and I think you've got another step in you. That's why going to church isn't enough. You've got to go to the altar, too. I'm sorry for making that real for you. Why go to church and not go to the altar and in a Pentecostal apostolic church? I don't understand that at all. Why come through the traffic? Why drive 45 minutes? Why go through everything you went through all week? Why fight the devils you fought and then sit there and when he says come, you sit there? No, no, no. If I'm here, let me get to him. If I'm here, let me get in the altar. If I'm here, let me, if I'm going to go through it. At least, at least let me get a breakthrough when it's over. If I'm going to fight the devil, at least let me feel Jesus before I leave Wednesday. That's why I come on Wednesday night, because I need to touch him. I need to feel him. I, I know, shut up. I need to know that he's there, and I go through all that, so I'm going to go further when I'm in his Come on, you've got another step in you. Woe is me. Woe is me. Jesus said, come here. And as she's coming, he said, woman, thou art loosed or set free from thine infirmity. Now, I don't see any chains. Bishop, I don't see any ropes. I don't see anything tying her up. 
But Jesus knows there's a demon right on her. This is why I go to an apostolic church. Because the demons can come in, but they don't get the chance to really go out with you. If, you. if you make up your mind to get to Jesus, they'll come in with you, but they won't leave with you. If they leave with you, you didn't go after Jesus with everything you have. Because there's something about Jesus that takes the thing squeezing you off of you. That's why you should never roll your eyes at somebody that's headed to the altar. Because when they're headed to the altar, the chains are falling off. You can't see them. You don't see any ropes. You don't see any shackles. But when they make up their mind, I'm going to get to Jesus, something just fell off of them. It could, it could stay on them in the pew, but it can't stay on them in the altar because they're going to be free. Some of you have been tied up by that demon long enough. It's had your mind, had your marriage, had your thought life. It's had your vision. It's had your heart. It's been squeezing you. You need to make up your mind. I'm going to take one more step and get in the altar and get this thing off. Thou art loosed from thy infirmity. Then he laid his hands on her. So he spoke it. He said, you're free, Brother Joel. But then he touched her to confirm what he spoke. This is why you believe and receive the word even when you don't feel anything because the word that goes forth doesn't return void. And someone can say you're healed and you still feel the pain in your body, but you wake up the next morning with no pain in your body. Why? Because the word precedes the touch. And if you believe the word, you can receive the touch. Let's go deeper. I got something here. I think you can. Let's go deeper. Okay. So here's where, here's where God messed with me today. He laid his hands on her. And it hit me. He's, she's bent in half. And he laid his hands on her. Isn't she under enough pressure? Didn't say he pulled her. It, it, when you lay your hands on something, you're adding weight to whatever's going on. See, if you really love me, Lord, you will reach down and pull me up. But you didn't even. What do you do when you have enough pressure already and then God puts his pressure on your pressure you already have bills. You already have stress. You already got stuff at home. You already got life happening. And then Jesus shows up and says, I want you to be faithful on Wednesday night. I want you to, get, I want you to be in the altar. I want you to live for me. I mean, isn't this enough? He didn't yank me back. He put more pressure on me. What do you do when God adds to the pressure that you're already under? It, it doesn't seem like it makes sense because, because she's already going down and the hand on her is, is not helping her come back. It's just touching her. But when he touched her with the pressure, she reversed. You got to get this. One touch from God and 18 years of directional pressing was reversed in one service. One touch from God and 18 years headed one way was reversed and yanked back because that's why you go to the altar. Because shut up. Because one touch from God.
One touch from God and the drug addict is an ex-drug addict. One touch from God and the alcoholic is an ex-alcoholic. One touch from God and the porn addict is an ex-porn addict because God's touch straightens you back up and reverses the cycle. It reverses the course that you're on. Somebody praise him for one touch because it was just one touch that reversed 18 years. I don't want a dead church. I don't want a church where they can't be delivered from witchcraft or lesbianism. I don't want a church where they come and nothing changes. I want a church where they come. Whoa, I can get out of that. I can be delivered from that. I can have a reversal. And one touch, and she's straightened up. Turn to your neighbor and say, straighten up. Come on, say it like you're mad. There we go. Psycho, it's good. Straighten up. One touch. And everything that had been saying, you're going to end up with your face in your feet, was removed. It's not just her back being healed. It's her vision being restored. It's her image being restored. It's her dignity, Shata, being restored. One touch from God, and she's not the issue in the building. She's in the body with everybody because he touched her. He didn't have to pull me. Jay, he didn't have to pull me. He didn't have to beg me. He didn't have to yank on me. He just touched me, and everything straightened up. That's the power of God. I'm thankful for all the courses of deliverance from addictions, and yes, we need them. But some of you just need an old-fashioned altar where you come up here, and God touches you, and he reverses the stronghold. I'm not a failure. I'm not a loser. I'm not a victim. I'm a child of God. He straightened me. John the Baptist said, prepare the way of the Lord. Make the crooked path straight. And she glorified God. This is why I'm bent on worshiping him. That's why you can't roll your eyes with, with the spikes or but the Randall takes off running. They know what one touch can do. One service can take suicide out of your brain and never let it back in again. One service can take that thing attacking you and make it leave you forever. Well, I don't know. I have to make sure it's right. I've got to control God. You're not God's CEO. When God decides to heal, if you don't believe him, he'll heal people right in front of you. He wants you to know that one touch of his power, everything. There are people in this room. Oh, I'm going to get real. I'm not going to ask you to. I'm not going to embarrass you. But would you be honest, there are people in this room that your whole life was headed one direction down. You couldn't conquer the addictions. I'll wait on you. You couldn't conquer the stronghold. I don't care how nice your cape is. You couldn't conquer it. But one touch from God. That's why you don't praise you. That's why you don't worship me. We worship the one who with one touch straighten us out. Aren't you thankful? Not just physical healing. How you're thankful for the times he corrected you. And with one touch, he straightened you up. You were starting to head down the wrong way. And one touch, and you got back. Shut up. You got back in line. One touch from God. 
So I'm sorry, but I'm bent on praising him. I'm bent on worshiping him. You don't know how good it's been. You don't know where he brought me from. You don't know how long he's put up with me. He picked me up. Turn me around. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Savior. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. God's the one that did it when I couldn't find my own way, when I couldn't know what to do. He turned me around. He straightened up my back. He straightened up my mind. He straightened up my marriage. He straightened up my finances. God straightened me out. Touch my mind. Touch my body. Restore. That's what he does. It's Wednesday night, but it feels like Sunday night back. Huh? There's something powerful about knowing one touch. Some of you have been glorifying the old you, pointing back, telling people, if you could have seen me then, Hear me in the Holy Ghost. The Lord's talking to me right now. Pretty soon, you will not have to point back to your past about what you were. You will point up and say, God did this. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. You won't even mention yesterday. You're just going to exalt him for what he's doing now. One touch and 18 years of whispering spirits. One touch and 18 years of voices saying it will never change. You'll never get better. You'll never be healed. You'll never get restored. You'll never be redeemed. You'll never see Jesus. You'll never be accepted. One touch from God and everything changed. You know what's just as awesome as the miracle of her back getting straight is her demon getting sent. Some people say, Pastor, I was baptized when I was six years old. Can you baptize me again? I know exactly why they're asking that. They don't doubt the baptism, but they've had a demon. You didn't know what you were doing. You made all your mistakes after that. You failed your whole life after that. You did this. You did that. You committed adultery. You lost your mind. You lost your marriage. You, you did this. And they say, rebaptize me. They know the power of the blood. They're wanting to shut the devil up. So I always rebaptize them. Why? Because I don't care. I know they're already good. But when they come out of that water, the demon stays in the water and is not allowed to go home with them because he's made them strange. <laughs> Hebrews 11, stay standing, verse 21. Hebrews 11, verse 21. Jacob, when he was dying... Bless both the sons of Joseph. That's a powerful message in itself. And worshiped leaning. He didn't get healed, but he died worshiping. She got healed and worshiped. He didn't get healed and worshiped. Here's the conclusion of your worship series. Whether he does it or doesn't do it for you, he's worthy to be worshiped. Whether he heals it or doesn't heal it, he's worthy to be worshipped. Whether he changes it or leaves you in your mess, he's worthy to be worshipped. Whether he fixes it and everybody sees you're a brand new creature or you're dying and nothing's getting better. But as you're dying, you're blessing the next generation. You're going to come out. You're going to be anointed. You're going to be used of God. You're going to see miracles. And when you get that, you are a worshiper.
Get this. A praiser needs results. But a worshiper needs a relationship. Anybody can praise him. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for making a way. Praise tells him what he's doing. But a worshiper says, if you don't do it, if my back pain doesn't go away, if you never heal my side, if you never touch my body, if you never take the pain out of my stomach, if you never take the arthritis out of my leg, if you, if you never do it, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be leaning, Brother Hearn, but I'm a worshiper. You're not going to out-worship me. You will not out-dance me. You will not out-praise me. You're not allowed to. Something's going on in me. I've got to lean, but I'm a worshiper. I'm pain, but I'm a worshiper. Devil's fighting me, but I'm a Whether he straightens it out or he leaves you hanging, you got to worship. Whether he fixes it or doesn't fix it, you got to worship. Whether he heals you or doesn't heal it, you got to worship. You got to worship him. A worshiper is not doing it based on results, it's predicated on relationship. Because guess what? If he doesn't heal me, when I get to heaven, I'll be whole. It doesn't touch my mind. When I get to heaven, I'll have a clear mind. It's not a matter of if I get healed, it's when I get healed. I watched in that conference Saturday morning. They brought a man up in a wheelchair, dying of stage four cancer. And they sent us all to pray for him. And Bishop Cunningham said, if God... He's going to be healed one of two ways. Either he's going to be healed miraculously or he's going to go to heaven. But he's going to be healed either way. And then Bishop Cunningham said, anybody that's had cancer, raise your hand. And all these people raised their hand. He said, you've got dominion. Get out of your pew. And when they started charging that man, he got out of the wheelchair and the place exploded as they began to walk toward him. I was watching with my own eyes. Some of them, God had done it. I didn't know if God was going to do it, but there was one thing for sure. Everybody was worshiping. Are you ready? Here's a tough one. If we get the building or we don't, If he saves my family, or if he don't, if he gives me the job, or if he doesn't, blessed be the name of the Lord. Here's what I feel to do in the Holy Ghost. I want you to come to the front right now, and I want you to, to lay hands on somebody. Jacob was hurting and dying, but he was worshiping and blessing at the same time. And you got to lay your hands on someone when you're hurting and release a blessing to them. Can you speak life to someone while you're dying on the inside? Can you say God's going to heal you when he's not healing me? Can you, shata, can you worship while you're bent? Grab somebody. Put your hand on them. Bless them right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Worship with them right now. Lay your hands on them and speak life to them. Lay your hands on them and speak a blessing in their marriage. Lay your hands on them and speak something into their home. Lay your hands on them and speak something into their life. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. He addeth no sorrow therewith. Sometimes you got to worship him when you don't have an answer, when you don't have a way out, when you don't have a change. Turn me around. 
place my feet solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior. I thank God. I thank God. I'm going to praise him whether I feel it or not. I'm going to worship him whether I feel it or not. Whether he fixes me or leaves me hanging. Whether he blesses me or breaks me. God, I've got to worship. Because you my heart. Change my name.